Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me. I am going to be putting together another one of those presentations where I'm talking with my webinar audience. If you're not here, you will see the first part of this presentation, which will be about COVID boosters. Are they putting you at risk? And this is an important discussion for people to reflect on in relation to choices as to what happens now. We have an important principle with regards to informed consent, and therefore there is a responsibility to always try and share information, update it to the public so that they understand what is going on. So I will be sharing with you an important paper or the thoughts from an important paper in this presentation, and I recently made reference to it, and it is to do with, let me just, this um, paper here, post-vaccination IgG4 and IgG2 class switches are associated with increased risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And um, this is an important piece of research. And it's something that we knew from 2022, but kept on being pushed aside. And as more and more evidence is accumulated, we start to realize this is a problem and it needs to be addressed one way or the other. So let's get started. As I said, the first part of this presentation will be um, available on YouTube. Look out for the link if you hope to watch the full presentation in the near future. So let's get started. COVID boosters. Are they putting you or your loved ones at risk? This is an important question and one that is inconvenient from a scientific point of view, but it still needs to be asked. As a routine, I always have a disclaimer, just so that you recognize that this information is information. It cannot replace you going to see your emergency doctor or physician and getting help if you are unwell. So let's get started with the basics. There is a question that has been floating around for a long period of time, and it's an important question, and it's very simple. We were promised protection, so why is the virus still spreading? You've been told all kinds of stories about the fact that the variants you know, are evading immunity and so on, and this is why there is ongoing circulation. But if you've been following me for some time, you should have realized that one of the big questions that I asked is, why are we having different outcomes in low vaccinated regions? It has been ignored. I've looked at Papua New Guinea. I've looked at Haiti. I'm planning to get some more information about Madagascar. There are many places that are doing absolutely fine, even though they are not vaccinated. What's the difference? Well, the answer is in the research. So here is what we're going to be covering in this presentation. An overview of the immune system, specifically the mucosal immune system, how the mRNA vaccine works, understanding IgG4, as well as other tolerant antibodies, and the potential implications of these boosters and ideas for the future. You may notice that very few people talk about this. There are a number of people who keep on raising awareness of it, but it has largely been ignored. And I think that that is a mistake. So again, always starting with the basics. Here we have a virus with the spike protein, about 25 on the surface of the virus. It's a trimeric spike so that each one of the three points can bind to ACE2 and enter into a cell. This is what it looks like upright. So this is the ACE2 binding section at the top right here. And this is the standard with regards to all the variants of coronaviruses. Now, you must remember that when they talk about variants, they're only talking about very slight changes to the receptor binding domain and sometimes the N-terminal domain of the spike protein. But the rest of the virus is still largely the same. So this only becomes a problem when the immune system is only focused on the spike protein. Broad immunity tends not to have this issue. And that's one of the first acknowledgements that should have been done by the scientific community. 
When it comes to protecting against disinfection, because it is so good at evading the immune system, you need to have good upper airway mucosal immunity. Just think of it like a skin inside of your airway, where even though the virus can infect cells, it can't necessarily easily break through to get into the systemic circulation. These represent lymph nodes, blood vessels, and trigger an antibody response. This is why some people who had infection never seem to have any antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, largely because their mucosal immunity was so effective, the virus couldn't break through that. That's the point of good mucosal immunity. And this is what it could look like here, where you have a mucosal defense. This is the airway, air up here. You have a layer of mucus that prevents the virus from binding to the cilia to get down into the cell. Even if they infected a cell, you have this defense of immune cells right underneath that the virus would have to get through. If it gets through that, then it can get into the bloodstream. But this immune system is very sophisticated. And this is something that people have either forgotten or inconveniently pushed aside so that they could continue with a narrative that doesn't necessarily fit the scientific approach. When it comes to understanding which immune cells are relevant, I've put together, as always, a COVID immune team. When we think of all of these immune cells, I've likened them to an army, where the monocytes or macrophages are like the tanks. And for most parts of COVID, long COVID, severe COVID, COVID storm, this is central. And we're working on the research to explain all of that. Your foot soldiers or your pawns are the neutrophils. Your T cells, these are like your, um, your air force. B cells produce antibodies that target at a distance. These are like the missiles. And your natural killer cells represent the, the Navy. And all of these work together to fight COVID. It's just that when you have an infection, a whole section of these are taken out to become less effective which is part of the reason why COVID is overall suppressing the immune system. As I pointed out in terms of understanding how immunity works, you have to understand that natural immunity is very broad. People would think that natural immunity is primarily composed of the spike protein. Remember I showed you the virus with different proteins on it and inside it. What you find when you actually look at the science is this. When they looked at the epitope bindings, these are all the tiny points on the virus that are targeted by the immune system. You can see that the majority of targets are in the green area, which is the open reading frame 1AB. So this is one of the proteins that are made after the virus has infected the cell. Only 21% 20, of these epitopes target the spike protein, 11% to the nuclear capsid, and then a few to the M protein and a few to the ORF3A protein. This is very important. And this is something you will not hear. And this is part of the reason why if you only focused on the spike protein, especially on the original variant, suddenly your epitopes are down to a tiny fraction which therefore means people keep on getting infected. I don't know why that's so difficult to understand. One important thing from that diagram, because the most significant epitope is the ORF1B protein, what that means is that most likely for mucosal immunity, it's not antibodies that the immune system depends on. It's what we call cell-mediated immunity. And what that means is that as soon as the cell becomes infected with the virus, starts to produce the RNA, starts to produce the proteins to make new viral particles, one of them is the ORF1B. When this is made, every cell, for every protein that is made, it takes a piece of it and puts it on the surface, just so that the immune system can check to make sure it's not virally infected. What would happen is protein would be stuck on here, and so the immune system would know to target the cell and destroy it. 
And this is what then happens, and this is why mucosal immunity is so effective. The virus, even if it changes its shirt with regards to the spike protein, the immune system is able to recognize multiple other factors about it. But it's not just that you have immunity focusing. They found, very strangely, that you had a situation with regards to ongoing boosters where it's related to increased risk of infection. And this was a Cleveland study, Effectiveness of Coronavirus Disease 2019 Bivalent Vaccine. And what they found was quite remarkable. On the left here is the cumulative incidence of COVID-19. At the bottom here is the timeline, time since start date, zero days up to 196 days. Guess what? At the bottom in the black line, zero doses. So what they noticed was that the more doses that were given, the higher the risk of infection. Now, how do you explain that? That is most unusual, and the highest is with regards to greater than three doses. You have to understand that this was available since 2023. It seems as though it was again in convenient science. And in, in effect, what the paper said, the risk of COVID-19 also varied by the number of COVID-19 vaccine doses previously received. The higher the number of vaccines previously received, the higher the risk of contracting COVID. It's important to note this is not necessarily severe COVID because we do know from the data that the vaccines do have an impact on blunting the severity of COVID, which is valuable, which is what they were looking for. However, we're not so sure it had an impact on all-cause mortality because excess deaths still seem to be elevated all across the vaccinated world, another inconvenient piece of science. Here we go into understanding a little bit more about immunoglobulins. These are antibodies, and you have five different types. IgM, early responder, in early infection. This is actually five of these tied together, so it's a big molecule. We don't talk much about IgD. IgG is the most important one. We'll come back to it in a second. IgA is, tends to be in your mucosal secretion, sometimes in the bloodstream. And IgE is about allergens and allergic responses. When we look at IgG, which is the most important long-term antibody, you have four different types, IgG1, 2, 3, and 4. As everything in the body, there is balance. Just like you have the biceps, you will have the triceps. The body always alternates so that there is an ability to get balance. And when you look at the balance in terms of immunoglobulins, the kind of immunoglobulins that trigger strong immune responses are IgG1 and IgG3. In balance, they have IgG4 and IgG2. And the reason I'm highlighting that is because one would expect that if you are having or targeting um, immune, uh, immunity and better immunity, you should have higher IgG1 and IgG3. But what the paper clearly was finding, elevated levels of IgG4 and IgG2, class switch, which, no surprise, was associated with increased risk of infection. How do you explain that? Increased risk of infection, in some cases less severe disease. It all fits when you look at it from an autoimmune perspective, but many people still don't quite understand that. What they found when they looked at the IgG switch, and it's important to note that this observation was from 2022. We're now in 2025. There is no excuse for ignoring this. There was almost a 4,000% increase in IgG4 after the third vaccine. That is unprecedented. And this should have been a red flag. 2022 was when this research was done. 
36, 38.6 times increase. Why was that not considered to be absolutely critical to investigate? What is science doing? Why are they silent on these things? It got even worse in the future when another study came out. If you think that's bad about IgG4, we couldn't figure out why people's immunity was not lasting for very long, three to six months at most. What is going on? Well, it turned out that we found again that long-lived plasma cells don't actually want to survive with the spike protein. They compared influenza, tetanus, and SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Oh, well, not the virus, just the spike protein. After two and a half months, these are LLPC, long-lived plasma cells. None after two and a half months. No wonder you have a drop-off in antibodies. After 14 months, none. After 23 months, two dots. And if you compare that to what happens in terms of tetanus and influenza, completely different scenario. And so this indicates that there is something about how the immune system responds to the spike protein that is a red flag. All of these questions needed to be answered. Why is that happening? It's important to note that when I speak about IgG4, it's not just to the spike protein because it doesn't really happen in the context of not natural infection or adenovirus vaccine infections or to a much lesser extent. Why in the world would that be? So there is something unique about the mRNA spike protein that differentiates the immune response. I wonder what that could be. One of my thoughts, and this is only just from my research, is to do with the fact that they added two proline residues between the S1 and the S2 component to stabilize it. I wonder if it's making the immune system unable to try and get rid of this protein. This is the kind of thing that can occur in the body and lead to very, very unusual patterns in terms of immunity. So the principle is still, we were promised protection. So why in the world is the virus still spreading? Only through answering the science will we get the answers. And as you stay with me, I will take you through the next steps of this journey. Thank you all very much. Uh, if you're on YouTube, um, we're going to have to let you go. And um, we'll be continuing with our webinar, um, folks. And if you want to see the full presentation as I explain some more of the science and about mRNA vaccines and where we are for the future, please look out for the link for this presentation. And have a great evening. We look forward to sharing more information soon.